Good morning, everybody. I oh, couldn't ask for a better hype man than that. Uh, okay, so hi ho everybody. My name is Patrick McKenzie, better known as Patty Eleven on the internet. For those of you who don't know me, uh, I ran, depending how many you count it, uh, five software slash uh, consulting slash training businesses over the course of about ooh, 2006 through 2016. More recently, I joined Stripe. I'll tell you a little bit about that later. I've been at MicroConf for a very long time. Uh, so. Uh, in the first microconf back in 2011, Rudico and I were engaged. Now we have two wonderful children. Uh, sadly, they couldn't make it this year. Um, I know we have some folks who are the uh, plus one out in the audience. Thank you so much for coming. Uh, the, the thing that I say every year is that this is why we do it, that uh, part of the ethos of microconf is creating a, a business that allows us to lead the life we want to live and to be present in our families, be present in our communities, uh, to have a better way of working. And the thing that I've come to appreciate, and I think that the folks who have uh, been doing this for a few years uh, can also appreciate, is that it's not just uh, why we do it, it's also how we do it. Um, the unsung hero behind every business that has a, that has a founder with a family is the family. Um, and those of you who, who have been in this situation know what I'm talking about. So can we get a round of applause for both the family members in the audience and those who are supporting us at home? So I always, uh, oh, that was one slide faster than I thought it was. I always uh, I think, what am I gonna talk about this year? And I try to be like super tactical and crunchy while being a little inspirational. So I was thinking, okay, what is this super tactical, crunchy thing that you wanna do over the next 60 days? And then I thought, ooh, maybe I've been spending a little too much time recently in Silicon Valley because this is not really a 60 day endeavor. Um, oh. I hit the big black button. Yeah, sorry. Okay, recoverable errors, yay. Um, the, uh, you're going to produce value in your business over a time scale of your career. And plus or minus, that's 40 years. And so the next 60 days are important and I want to give you some uh, actionable advice for what to do on them. But I want you to uh, like keep an eye on the long game. You're producing, uh, value in your community, value for yourself, uh, producing things that will sit with you four years from now. Not for four years from now, although for four years from now too, for many years from now. And so uh, you should be making decisions with that in mind. And when you're thinking about decision making for the long haul, not every decision you have to make right now has to be the right one. You're going to make a lot more small bets. Re much rather you make 10,000 small mistakes than one big mistake. Most of this, uh, at uh, work, we have this thing called like a trapdoor decision. It's virtually irreversible after, after you've done that. Very little of what you do in business is irreversible, particularly at our scales. Even if you make the wrong business entirely, which I've done at least twice, probably like closer to three times, um, like that's a reversible decision. You can, uh, you can kill something very early without any uh, user-facing consequence if you're already in the business. You can sell the business off to someone and uh, do something new. So I want you to be quickly decisive with regards to things that don't matter in the long run if you're, if you're wrong. Make more decisions, make them faster, rather than agonizing over, is this exactly ready for launch right now? Am all my bug, bugs done? Is this piece I'm writing perfect? Get it out the door. And do things with an eye towards the long haul. There's so many incentives in culture to maximize for the short-term thing, to say like, oh, I'm blogging, I should blog about that thing that's in the news this week because that will get more attention but that does not create value for you over the long term. You have a sharply limited amount of time as an as a entrepreneur who's doing, the, doing this for yourself or with a small team. Do things which will matter years from now. If you're going to write, write about something, write about something that will still be a thing five, 10, 20 years down, down the line. Write it like you're gonna own it. So, I was watching this bad movie recently, and uh, I won't go into the specifics of the bad movie, it's Your Highness, if you are <coughs> tired after microconf and want to watch a bad movie, it's a great bad movie. Um, at one point, the evil wizard like, flies into a kingdom and tries to kidnap the princess from a wedding, and the king, you know, good King Righteous is like, how are you going to beat all of my knights and my armies to kidnap the princess? And the evil wizard says, magic, duh. Um, he doesn't say duh, he says a word that is trademarked by Samuel L. Jackson, which is not appropriate for microconf. Um, <laughs> how are you going to build a business in the next 60 days? Grinding, duh. Not this kind of grinding. Um, 
there are two easy ways to make money at MicroConf. One is to charge more for your products, and the other is to get into mo more poker hands with me. But when I say uh, grinding, what I mean is that you do not need the long-term perfect brand strategy. You do not need the systems and processes that you're going to have in, the, in uh, year five of your business. You do not need to feel like you are the expert on the subject. You do not need to even say with confidence, I know what I'm doing. You need to go out there every day, do things that are repetitive, that create small amounts of value, and that you can do again in the future. And you need to do it a lot over time. And do it more, like, more repetition than is comfortable. This is tough for me because I have a sort of like, business ADD. But do the grinding. The number one question that I get asked from folks who are at roughly earlier stage is, what should I build? I've tried to answer that question for years. I've come to, the, come to the conclusion that it is just a tough question to answer because it is the wrong question to ask first. The right question to ask first is, who should I serve? Who, when you're talking to, do you feel a real connection with? Do you feel a calling to their community? Like, this is not going to be merely my job. This is not going to be a thing that I build to trade for money. This is going to be a part of my life for the next several years. Be smarter than me. I had a great idea for a business once. I won't go into much detail. It was, uh, the long and short of it would be that I would be talking to uh, receptionists at dental offices a lot for the next couple of years of my life. And Peldi, who runs Balsamic, said, Patrick, I think I know you. I just have to ask, are you going to bounce up with enthusiasm every morning managing the schedule of dentist offices? And I said, oh, God, no. But it's going to be a great business. If the prospect of working with the community that you are choosing to serve causes you to think, oh, God, no. <laughs> if you feel contempt for the customers that you are seeking out, um, maybe don't do that. Spe speaking of which, um, the desire to serve someone is its a tough thing to quantify. Like, I can't tell you who to marry. Like, what, how do you answer the question, who should you love? The desire to serve is a little bit different than love. But generally, um, when, when I got to the point in my career where I realized when I talk to software people, I always enjoy the conversation. Whether they're a developer, whether, whether they're in business, I bounce with enthusiasm. I was in a business that served teachers for about eight years. And after about six years of talking to teachers, it's like, oh God, please no, please no. You're going to ask me to do like, unpaid tech support again. And I was really, really tired of like, getting asked how many, uh, it doesn't even matter. Um, find the people that you don't get tired of talking to. It doesn't necessarily have to be a group that you're a member of, but one that you can empathize with and that you feel, mm, yes, if these aren't my people already, I want to be like them when I grow up, or at least I want to work with them. Find people whose problems are tractable. Like, a lot of folks here are very mission-focused, and you might be mission-focused to do something like, I really want to make a dent in global poverty. And that is an awesome mission to have, but that is a very difficult mission to execute on and meaningfully move the needle as a single person who is paying it out of your own pocket. You, uh, it is much easier to find, find a, a group of uh, folks who have problems that a single person working really hard for the next couple of years can like, materially impact. And this is a controversial bit of advice uh, when I talk to some people. It's relatively uncontroversial in MicroConf. And honestly, I think it's responsible for like, the baseline level of success of MicroConf attendees having roughly doubled in the last three years of me just chatting around uh, in the hallway track. Serve people who can afford to pay for solutions. Largely, that means businesses. Sometimes it means like you know, you're selling directly to customers, but the customers tend to be programmers, and they're using it uh, for improving their own professional opportunities. If you have charitable impulses, it is much easier to do those charitable impulses from running a healthy business than it is to, do it the, to attempt to make money serving the charitable, uh, charitable impulses. I was serving teachers during my day job and having like, my fun nights and weekend time talking to entrepreneurs. And I was doing a poor job at both relative to, I could have had my like, day job be serving entrepreneurs and software people, made a lot more money a lot easier, and then subsidized the price of everything I was doing to teachers down to free, and I would have been much less frustrated with talking to teachers every day, and they probably would have been less frustrated working with me. I think we have this image that when you think of the business that you want to be running when you grow up, that, wow, they've got it all put together. There's this tapestry of awesomeness. They've got all the pieces of the puzzle figured out. 
I work at a company, and oh man, we do not have it figured out. Everybody is making this up as they go along. Uh, I think Patrick Collison had a great quote at MicroConf Growth. Like, the first time he walked into a bank office and tried to get uh, credit card processing for Stripe, they felt like three squirrels in a trench coat that were impersonating a business. <laughs> the thing that Patrick might not have mentioned is that that feeling never goes away, ever. Don't feel like you need to have this. What you want to do is have something closer to this. You're building a puzzle over time. You're creating, you're grinding. Every day, you're adding a little bit. Now, puzzles aren't the greatest analogy because like puzzles, there is some defined end state. There is no end state for your business. You're going to be snapping little pieces together. Every piece that you get gets you a little more. There's multi-dimensions to this, so like a piece that's about marketing gets you a little more credibility with customers, a few more prospects, et cetera, another topic that you know well, a little bit of product development gets you uh, even more satisfied customers. Snap, 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 snap. And when you think, did I accomplish something today? Your question is, is there another piece in the puzzle that wasn't there yesterday and will still be, be there in years? And if you can say yes to that, you've had an excellent day. If you can't say, uh, say yes to that, do things better tomorrow. Grind it out. The one thing that counts as a puzzle piece, but that doesn't produce something that's like visible and tangible and that you could literally point to it, is talking to people. It is never a bad time to talk to a customer or talk to a prospect if you're having high, value, high bandwidth conversations with them about their problems, about their desires, about what they need. I'm a pretty shy guy. I hate uh, sending out uh, email generally. I hate phone calls. These are not great attributes to have in an entrepreneur, but some of you might be like, be like me, so hey, you can make it work. Just let you know, uh, if you are capable of like, sending out cold emails to people that you've never met, that is an awesome, awesome skill to have. Um, there was once this Irish guy who like, cold emailed bingo card creator to get them to switch away from PayPal. He had never talked to me before. Um, email went to spam filter. Very expensive spam filter, miss guys. Thank you, Google. What should you be working on in the next 60 days? Should you be immediately doing product development? Build a platform before you build your product, if you don't already have a platform. Do I mean a platform like install Ruby on Rails and get the magic technical goodness together so that you can build a platform on top of it? I don't. I mean, build a marketing platform. Uh, you hear people say in the community, audience first. Build the things that will allow you to engage an audience and to uh, improve it over time. You are doing the grinding. Build the thing that you can snap in other pieces to. What does that mean concretely? You're going to build three friend catchers. A friend catcher is this word that my mom taught me when I was younger, and I think my mom might be the only person who uses it in the world, uh, which is unfortunate. More people should know it. She said, Patrick, you should learn to cook. And I said, restaurants are a thing in the world. I never have to learn to cook. And my mom said, no, don't, le don't learn to cook because you want to eat food. Learn to cook because if you learn to cook, you will have a built-in excuse for the rest of your life to bring people over to your house. No one who knows how to cook will ever lack for friends. Like, ooh, that is a smart idea. When you're building friend catchers, you're going to be building something that solves problems for people because no one who solves problems for people will ever lack for people to talk to who have problems. They will come with their problems to you. And people coming with their problems to you is an excellent position to be in as an entrepreneur. Write five emails, we'll talk a little bit about that later, and then spend 45 days of grinding it out. No great brand strategy, no uh, you don't have to build the systems and processes yet. You can figure out that later. But every day, you wake up in the morning, you email people, you get on more Skype calls, you write another post, you get on Twitter, et cetera, et cetera. Grind it the heck out. Let's talk a little bit more about friend catchers. What's the I, like? How do you think of what you want to produce? You want it to be in the sweet spot of this Venn diagram and hit resonant, tractable, and underserved. Let's start with tractable. You want your friend catcher to genuinely solve the problem that it promises to solve, which means that your friend catcher should probably not be how to solve global warming. Instead, it should be something like, if you were writing a, uh, a written article that's in the 4,000 to 8,000 word range, which happens to be my sweet spot, what's, about, what's something you can cover great in that topic? Like, salary negotiation for engineers is something that you can cover in that, in that amount. That's the single best blog post I've ever written. Don't write blog posts, I'll tell you why later. But um, like, that's the last word on salary negotiation for engineers. You can, well, you can certainly learn more of it, but it's like the last, the last like, primer that uh, anyone needs to read on it. And 500,000 people, I visit that every year. Why? Because it is resonant. 
you want something, there's this wonderful word in Japanese, aru aru, which means like you've just heard of something and you're like, oh yeah, that thing, that thing, totally something I deal with. Everybody deals with that, right? You want something that when your audience sees that it exists, not only did they say, oh, F yes, I knew, I didn't even know I needed that. I knew I needed that. I know other people need that too, because that will incentivize them to promote it to their friends. So like, if you are doing training in the community, um, I was talking to uh, someone who was writing ebooks and courses for the JavaScript community. So you find the things that are like push emotional buttons for the JavaScript community. And not in the cheesy way of like React versus Vue, death fight to the max, but things like, can I get a show of hands among JavaScript developers here? Okay, everybody look at somebody that has their hand up right now and watch what happens when I say these words. Build pipeline. Yeah. <laughs> write about the build pipeline, because everybody knows it is terrible, terrible, terrible stuff. And then you, you want to uh, do things that are underserved. I like to, to phrase this as filling holes in the internet. Um, you know, like the one-on-one -on -one guide to your field of choice has probably been done 100 times. The two-on-one guide specific to a particular industry, probably never done. The, like, um, you can generate an infinite number of combinations of, hey, how do you use technology A plus technology B together, where that is something that people are doing every day and cutting their teeth on every day and crying tears over every day, but no one has ever committed to the freaking internet yet? You can be that person and own that uh, combination for the, until the end of time. When I was doing my last startup, Starfighter, um, NSQ, which is this, uh, this event-based queuing technology, WebSockets. I want to tie NSQ to the WebSockets. Clearly, some engineer somewhere has done that, and there was nothing on the internet. And we looked for weeks, and I had to like, write it all by myself. I would much prefer to have written, uh, to read the guide about that. I could have re read the guide written by any of the, there's probably at least five people in here who have written that code themselves. Great form factors for friend catchers. Again, find things that really energize you, find things that you love doing, find things that you're good at. But if you just don't have ideas like, what am I good at yet? Because you haven't been running this business for long, no problem. Um, I happen to be pretty de decent at writing. Was not decent at writing for uh, teaching purposes until I started a business. But the thing that basically made my career is the stick a fork in it, it's done. This is the, like, I'm planting a flag in this topic. I'm just going to write a guide about it. And people come to it for years. A calculator which replaces an Excel spreadsheet. This is unreasonably effective because most of the world cannot program even at the level of like a silly Excel spreadsheet. So um, there is almost no calculation too trivial for a calculator for that to be material to folks. Like there is, a, uh, I do A-B testing quite a bit. And uh, every time I do A-B testing, somebody internally is like, oh, how do I do an A-B testing uh, statistics, statistical significance calculation? I'm like, oh, that's really easy. You just do blah, 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 and know the Google A-B testing calculator and go to one of the same two pages that has had that up for 10 years. And I know those pages have generated tens or hundreds of millions of dollars of leads because people just don't want to do two minutes of work in Excel. Um, calculators are a wonderful thing. Definitive curated list of resources. Um, I honestly don't like listicles, uh, but this isn't a listicle. This isn't like 10 cute cat photos that you can use while selling enterprise software. That, that listicle is an actual thing that was produced at a client of mine. Um, yeah. um, you, again, you're producing things that stand the test of time. You're planting a flag on the internet. What is the definitive list of everything that has been written that is great and outstanding in this field? Like uh, Josh Kaufman is probably still somewhere in the audience. He writes the personal MBA. Josh Kaufman has the definitive book list of business books, and that is his thing, and that does fantastically well for him. He, he updates it every year. And then cheat sheets. Amy Hoy is also in the audience. I am friends with Amy Hoy specifically because of the Ruby on Rails cheat sheet. Back in the day, like, if you're getting started with Ruby on Rails and there's all these magic commands that you don't, don't know yet, like um, mm, uh, Rails, create something or other to, to make a new project, or uh, how to load model objects, et cetera. She put it all on one page of a downloadable PDF file, which had like, some nice design, because Amy is a wonderful designer, and I remember that it was pink. And then three years later, I met her in person, and I'm like, oh my god, that's Amy Hoy. That's Amy Hoy of the Ruby on Rails cheat sheet. I've had that up next to my computer for the last three years. And I was literally afraid to talk to her, but it turns out she's awesome. Um, you can be the person that people are afraid to talk to. <laughs> no. You can put on the page that uh, 
that uh, you host your friend catcher on, hey, if you are interested in this, I would like to sell, uh, send you more things you like. Give me your email address. <laughs> I would have totally given Amy Hoy my email address over that one. I think I did, probably. This does not have to be rocket science. Um, like it's literally field, a little bit of copy, give people a promise of what you're sending, uh, and this is what Stripe does on the bottom of the Atlas Guides, and uh, it is unreasonably effective. You have the opportunity to do some things that companies can't do at scale. I would abuse that opportunity. One thing is that how many people here have like 100 or 200 or indicatively that sort of number of people on your email list? Okay. So if you're in that situation, you might feel, oh goodness, I don't have enough emails. Other people have like 20,000. I don't know if I can get any business results out of that. You have 100 people who, are, who want to hear from you, and you're getting more people who come in every week, and you should email every single one of them individually. You're grinding. Wake up in the morning, see who signed up since yesterday, open up Gmail, not your email thing of choice, open up Gmail and say, hey, this is me. I am unreasonably interested in this topic. I would love to chat with you about it or anything else that you want to chat about. And grind it, do it every day until, it gets, until you get sick of it. Everything you need to know about email courses in one slide. Um, I actually wrote a course about email courses at some point. Uh, I will put a link in it uh, in the Microconf Slack later to give you a free copy of it. But uh, this is the cheat sheet version. Every subject line that you write, make a promise of the value that is in that email, over deliver on your promises. That's the one copywriting trick you need to know if you know no others. Your email course should have about 75% educational material, 25% salesy. The salesy stuff tends to work better if it's in an email all by itself than sandwiched in, in between educational stuff. It's very important that you educate folks and continue creating value before you ask for value in return. It is also important that you ask for the freaking sale at some point. Believe me, um, like, this is my community. You are my people. I know some of you have the same issue I had when I was starting out, which is like, I'm embarrassed about charging even $20 for this thing that I've spent weeks of my life working on. I get that. You have to ask for the sale. Front of the delivery of email courses, because the moment at which someone signs up for your email course is the moment of their like, maximum happiness in their relationship to date. And at that moment, when the, like, the iron is hot, or whatever English, I don't speak it naturally anymore, um, <laughs> like, immediately start providing value. Follow it up with even more value, and then follow it up with a sales message, and then you can back off a little bit. Like, give people a little time to breathe in the relationship, decide, I really like uh, the cut of this person's jib, I like their voice, I like what they are teaching me, or, eh, you know, not for me. There's a world of infinite choices out there on the internet, and you want to find the people who are exactly right for you, and you want to over-deliver value to them over time. At the end of the email course, um, I typically do six to eight emails over the course of the month, but six to eight emails is a lot to write. Just start with five. You can write five emails in a day. Um, uh, just uh, establish the expectation that you're going to be sending pe people more things you like. That's all specific you have to be every two weeks. Four weeks if you get really busy, but I would tend to say mail them every two weeks rather than every four weeks. I have some prescriptive advice on checkpoints that you want to reach in your business. There is something that you might consider as a research phase. Like, it's become a little bit of a cliche, talk to customers. I want you to, I want you to think that I'm, you are going to be researching and you are going to be talking to customers for the rest of your life, 40 years here. But you are not out of the research phase into like the doing the cool stuff about my business phase until you've had at least 10 great conversations with people. If you're building a SaaS business, make that 25 conversations. Why do I say this? Because like, we're developers, we're designers, we're writers, we are builders of things, and that sounds fun to us, typically. And I think many of us here are, are introverts like myself, and it is very easy to like, you know, go in the code cave for, it'll just be six weeks. Uh, my last company, it'll just be three months, no problem, we've got three experienced engineers on this. Nine months later, no end in sight, and we had not been talking to anyone for that time. So time box, like, you know, commit to talking to people first. Keep talking to people, but don't start, don't start like the fun, expressive work until after you've talked to at least this many people. You're not done with grinding it out and sending out like individualized email to people and cold emailing folks, et cetera, et cetera, until you've got 500 emails on your list. 
after that, you can start writing you know, a scalable marketing engine, like figuring out, OK, what new guides do I want to put, uh, like optimizing my email, uh, email course, et cetera, et cetera. Don't worry about that until you have 500 emails. Just keep grinding. Before you publish a SaaS, have 10 commits to buy it on day one. If you can't get 10 commits to buy it, you will have an awfully long, hard time selling it. You're going to want to establish a repeatable cadence of doing the work. I have this funny thing about me. I've had years where I've worked five hours a week, like when I was running Bingo Card Creator. I've had years where I worked like a 20-hour work week when I was work doing a point reminder, a 40-hour work week, a 60-hour work week, a 100-hour work week. And it's funny, no matter how much I work, I can only get three things done in a week. And I've, here's how I always prioritize it. It's like a dinner plate. I've got my main dish, the one thing I want to get accomplished this week. That's half of my dinner plate. I've got two other things that I want to do that will almost certainly get done by the end of this week. And then everything else is dessert. And I expect probably not to get it done. And I would encourage you, like one of those three, uh, like either the 50% or one of the 25% allocations should be something that you don't like but you need to do. And one of them should always be talking to customers. And you can allocate the other ones how you want. But what you probably shouldn't do is to have business ADD like me and say, OK, this is going to be, be the week where I uh, set up the server and also do a little bit of coding on the project. And I think I want to interview some customers and maybe do a podcast tour too, and da 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 da. You will get to Friday and have very little to show for it. Every day that you work, you want to show up with objective, external indicia of progress or talking to a customer. Like sometimes talking to a customer does not produce an artifact on the internet. But everything else you do, have an artifact on the internet. Have another article that, that you've written that you can show to people. If you can only get a tweet out every day, a tweet is better than nothing. We saw excellent examples earlier of like astounding amounts of value that can, that can uh, be delivered in like one tweet and one screenshot. You should build the actual thing at some point. It should be awesome. <laughs> I really can't tell you much advice on how to build awesome things. The good part is, I think all of you have probably got pretty dialed in on that one. Raise your hand if you identify as having a little bit of imposter syndrome. Yeah, I feel you. Um, building an awesome thing does not mean you have to have the best thing in the world. Building the awesome thing does not mean you have to ship everything you want to ship when you, when you first start out. Building the awesome thing does not mean, mean that it has to be a, a work of outstanding genius that will be cited by people 200 years from now. Believe me, once you start doing business, you will realize where the bar is for businesses in the economy. And it's like, OK, here's where you get sued by people, and then here's the bar. <laughs> and you are so outstandingly over the bar right now. It, it is honestly a little bit disconcerting. You might think, oh, I'm competing against all these people in the world, other smart operators at MicroConf funded companies in Silicon Valley, all the traditional folks that are doing this in a less software-oriented kind of way. You have some advantages, and I would like you to lean into them. One of your advantages is the simple phrase, this is what I do. Because you are going to spend the next, like, even if you just spend 60 days on this, you are going to be much better than almost all of humanity about that topic you have spent 60 days on. Like, just do the math. How many people have ever done JavaScript build pipelines as a thing for 60 days, like with that crazy fire in the eyes. Very few, even among people who work with JavaScript every day. This is what I do, builds trust with customers. It's like, I don't really know if this is, if this is right for me. Trust me, this is what I do. Um, <laughs> honestly, so, uh, and you're not just saying that, you're representing it by your actions. So. Uh, I recently bought a house in Japan, and I was applying for mortgages, and the person who was selling me the house, the, the broker for the se selling company, uh, said, you'll be fine on the mortgages. And I'm like, I have an issue about me. It's sort of a complexion kind of issue that Japanese banks don't really love. I'm a little worried. And he's like, don't worry. I got this. And um, we got four approvals on four applications for mortgage. I'm like, wow, I got really lucky there. And he said, yeah, really lucky might have been me finding every underwriter for it and talking to them for two hours. And I'm like, oh, oh, wow, you did that? He's like, this is what I do. <laughs> you can be 
that guy. You can be unreasonably good at the, at the tiny details, and you can show people, like, again, externally verifiable indice of progress. You, you show people how good you are at it. You can be irrationally responsive to customers. Um, a business that has like hundreds of thousands of people working at it has to have processes where relatively low paid people are like, you know, they're cooking a book to order on what they can, uh, can do for their customers. You can do so much better than that every time. You can promise the moon and the, silver uh, the, moon and the stars on a silver chain. You can deliver it a week later because you are not just the, the head of customer support. You are also doing all the engineering decisions and you are also uh, uh, like willing to do what, whatever it takes to make your first couple of customers happy. And then superpower, you can move fast and make things. Not like the usual formulation of this one. Um, most companies in the world do not have a development team that is capable of doing anything. They don't have a marketing team that is capable of doing anything in like less than three quarters of notice. Uh, you can build things that both increase the value of the thing you are building, but also increase your ability to market and sell that thing you are building. Uh, and I've had presentations on this before. You can check the microcraft archives. It would not be a microcraft speech if I did not tell you to charge more. Charging more will get you better customers. Charging more will make you more money. Charging more will help you attract the kind of people who you want to serve for over the next couple of years of your life. More than what, Patrick? Whatever your number is right now, that number is too low. A little bit of laughter. This happens to be my true advice that I give to literally everyone, um, including at work. But if you just need to like, you know, take a photo and uh, steal a price point, these are some great price points. I'll give you a few seconds to take the photo. <laughs> a few more seconds. As long as folks are taking the photo, I'll talk you through a little bit of the, uh, of the theory behind the photo. Although I think it's like copy and paste these price points because they, uh, they work. Partly there's some of my work, partly it's just me stealing from other people. Feel free to steal this technology. Um, we price things at multiple tiers because we want to give our customers the option to put my hand up and say, I'm getting outstanding value from you because then you will be able to segment on the people who are getting outstanding value from you and say, okay, why did you do that? Um, and it might be because uh, I have an unusually strong need for this. Like, I have a team of 20 people who are blocked on this JavaScript build pipeline issue. Okay, that's interesting. That tells you more about what you should be building next, like you should be doing training for teams. It might be because they're in a segment of the industry that you might not naively have been aware of, but uh, just happens to have like, a very keen, keen need for it. Um, backups, for example. Like, Every business that has a server probably uh, should have backups, but some businesses care a lot more about them than others. Uh, healthcare, for example, ask me why, um, uh, et cetera. Charging more is not just to get more money, it's to help people put their hands up and, uh, and help you discover who like, the true audience that you're serving is. A little bit about Stripe Atlas. So uh, I've joined Stripe. I work on a product called Stripe Atlas. We help companies get up and running. Uh, so with uh, an incorporation of either a C corp, it's the typical kind of uh, corporation you would find on like the New York Stock Exchange, or an LLC, uh, which is a thing that I used in all five of my personal businesses. Uh, we give you a business bank account. We give you access to a community of entrepreneurs who are uh, roughly similar in character to the microconf community so that you can ask questions all the time. We do a bunch of other stuff, and there are 15 people working on making apps better every week. So. Uh, if it's interesting to you, come talk to myself, come talk to Alex, who is in the middle here and waving his hand. Uh, we would love to chat with you about it. Um, we have a bunch of cards that give you free access to Atlas. What does that free thing mean? It's kind of like a free puppy. A free puppy is a dangerous thing. Um, <laughs> so we will, we will pay for your, like we, Stripe, will pay for your incorporation. We will pay for your first year of registered agent fees. But the puppy will be wagging its tail next year and saying, <sighs> tax compliance. Um, and so, like, it's a commitment. So I would encur encourage you to, like, make the commitment with eyes open. But um, I honestly and truly believe, like, I've been a member of this community before I was an employee at Stripe, and I will be a member of this community probably long after I uh, hang up my Stripe jacket. Uh, like, it is a great option for you. Um, and we worked very hard this last year making it even better for microcon folks. Some boring business advice. Get a new credit card. Don't get a new credit card because, like, okay, new credit cards have like a sign-up of offer associated with them. It's like get 10,000 Delta miles. Here's the sign-up offer associated with a credit card that you get for a business, and it can either be a personal card or a business card. Get one week of your life back. 
because if you put every expense for the business on this credit card, then you have credit card statements next year uh, in April or whenever your taxes are due that you can refer and find every expense for the business. Um, it turns out in the kind of businesses we run, like tracking revenue is pretty easy because it all typically comes through like a single source, like you know payments providing company. Um, uh, maybe you're using PayPal. There's like a very small number of places that money is coming in. There's a large number of places where it's coming out, and it's easy to lose those. Um, sign up for, uh, for a Google Apps account under your own domain name. Uh, make an account at alias that you can use for all your SaaS things that you sign up for. Um, my account was 40, believe it or not. Uh, and at some point in the future, you might want to share those accounts with someone else, and you don't want to have to move them all serially from your personal name to, uh, uh, to the new person. Make a receipts at alias. Anything you buy, just forward it to the receipts at, or uh, have the provider uh, mail it to receipts at directly. Get a password manager. Um, both for the security benefits of having a password manager and also for being able to remember, dear God, where are all my accounts? Um, believe me, it gets complicated as you go along. In the medium term, get an accountant. Accountant is the professional in your life that will make you the most, the most amount of money relative to what you pay for them. Find a peer group to talk with, meet with them regularly. Um, if you uh, have made friends over Microsoft and you can establish a regular cadence of meeting, that is great for keeping your morale up. It is uh, great for uh, being able to talk through the challenges of the business that your usual organic support group will not be able to empathize with. And it's great for talking shop and bouncing ideas off each other. De-risk your family life. Uh, I'm a little bit short on time, so I can't talk too much about personal financial management. But there is a person who like, is irrationally interested in personal financial management in this room. That's John Knox. Uh, John, wave hand. Yeah, up here in the front. John has forgotten more about this than uh, I will ever know, and I know quite a bit about this stuff. So. Uh, Please talk to him about it. This is my email address, both in personal life for the next 40 years and at Stripe. Um, everybody who came from Stripe this year really, really wants to talk to you. There's, we care about your experience of our products. We care about supporting your businesses and all your endeavors, both now and in the future. And we really, really sincerely care about it working for you. There's some stuff in the industry right now that is a, that is a little bit difficult. Um, our company is growing relatively rapidly. We're having our fair share of teething pains. We would much rather hear the thing, uh, uh, your feedback from you than hear about it like three years from now in a Hacker News post about, oh, what happened to those Stripe? They used to be the cool people, but now they're, they've, they're not representing the needs of, uh, of uh, small entrepreneurs and developers. So please email us at any time. We will put a link in the MicroConf Slack for the email addresses to everybody, including the CEO, and he is totally serious. He will write you back. He will be very happy to get email from you. He may write you back. Sometimes he writes me back. Thank you very much, Patrick. Thanks very much.